All right, announcements. Tomorrow night at 6.30, we will meet for a church-wide prayer here. This Sunday, 9.30, Easter Sunday, we'll have a church-wide breakfast at 9.30. Um, and then following the breakfast, the kids will hunt Easter eggs at 10 o'clock. And Sunday school classes will meet um, at 10 o'clock. I guess if you have a kid in the Easter egg hunt, you'll probably be out there. But we will be having Sunday school at 10 o'clock. The new Mana Youth Rally is April 14th and 15th, and we plan to leave the church at 10 a.m. And there'll be no men's or ladies' fellowship this month. Okay, prayer request. Um, Miss Jocelyn Wheeler has an esophagus tear, if we could pray for her. And Brother Scott's mom, Jennifer, um, did not have a stroke, but she is still in the hospital with some kidney issues, but they are improving. Um, do we have any other prayer requests? No. I have a, I have a couple of praises. Uh, Cindy went to the doctor today, and um, they don't believe there's any heart issues um, from her issue last week. And I want to thank everybody. I know a lot of people were praying for my dad last week. He had a pacemaker put in, and he's at home and doing well. And thank you, everybody, for the prayers. Um, Brother Christopher, will you pray for our prayer request, please? Lord, thank you so much for that, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and mercy and grace, Lord. Lord, thank you for letting me up that worship. Lord, I ask you just to let you serve us now, Lord. I'm just asking you, Lord, that the end of the day, you can take away from everything that was taught. Mother, Lord, uh, Lord, she has to help you. She learned how to say that you do with us and them. Lord, all the unspoken, Lord, and serve us with the next time. I just pray that you just bless them, Lord, uh, that Father has to have him, Lord. Before um, Brother Austin comes, um, does anybody know where the preacher is? Uh, okay, three people, four. He's visiting his mom. Okay. All right. I just wanted to pick at him. <laughs> oh, we'll get him when he comes back. All right. I'd like to sing for you a song entitled, There Rose a Lamb. It was the third day since he died, and it was said he would arise. Then from the grave the Lamb came forth, oh, I have reason. chose the place he chose the eye that he would rise by his own power a sacrifice three days ago and now praise God this land
Dismiss the kids. <laughs> Dismiss the kids. The children can go. Well, if you're a uh, visiting with us don't judge this service based off what you're about to hear just come back so you can hear brother jesse okay <laughs> uh, i appreciate the opportunity to get to stand and preach uh always counting the privilege uh, blessing uh, mainly because i don't deserve to um i don't deserve anything uh if i got what i deserve if we all got what we deserve we'd all be in hell um, but thankful uh, that he came and he arose, um, so he wouldn't have to, and we could have forgiveness of sins. Um, John chapter number six tonight, if you have your Bibles, John chapter number six. John chapter number six. We'll start reading in uh, verse number 66. Uh, the Bible says this. It says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye, go away, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Uh, God, I thank you, Lord, for just your goodness and your mercy. God, I thank you, Lord, that you did rise again. Lord, I'm thankful that our faith is not in a dead God, but, Lord, it is a risen Savior. Lord, I'm so grateful for that. And, Lord, I 
pray, God, that you would just help us here tonight. Lord, I am uh, very inadequate to do what I'm about to do. And, uh, Lord, I need your help. And, God, I need your touch, Lord. And I pray, uh, God, that you would just have me to say everything I'm supposed to. And, uh, Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help me to speak the truth, God, but help me to speak it with the right spirit, Lord. And I pray, uh, God, that you would just open our hearts and our minds to your word. Uh, Lord, I pray, God, that uh, your word, God, would convict the hearts of your people, challenge us, God, comfort us, Lord, encourage us, God. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would leave differently, God, in the way that we came. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Tonight, I would like to preach on um, this thought, um, the anchor of the faithful. That's what I want to preach on, the anchor of the faithful. And we'll just get right into it, really the first two points, if you will, will probably be introduction, and then I'll take really the message from the last uh, point. But I want you to notice, first of all, the crowd that's departing in verse 66. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And we find this multitude, uh, I believe this, of disciples, because a disciple is a, a follower, and I, I believe that you find these followers that departed at the beginning of chapter number six and so uh, if you was to you don't have to we're not going to obviously go through the whole chapter but if you was to look over there in verse number two the bible says and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased and so this great multitude obviously they begin to um to, to follow Jesus, as the Bible says, because of the, they, they saw these miracles and they began to follow him. And I believe this is also the same group, if you read in verses 3 through 15, that was uh, the, the same group that, um, that was there that Jesus fed the 5,000. Uh, 5, I believe this was this multitude, this group of people where they got to actually be a part of the miracle of Jesus breaking the five loaves and the two fishes and feeding 5,000 people. So they were very much a part of that miracle. And then they got to see that uh, 12 baskets were left over after feeding. And that was just 5,000 men, the Bible says. There was uh, who knows really how many there were there. Uh, but Jesus uh, uh, fed a multitude of just that. And they got to see those miracles. And when they saw those miracles in verse number um, 14... They said that, uh, they, they begin to say, this is of a truth, that, that, that's that prophet that should come. And in verse 15, they were ready to crown him king. I mean, after these miracles, after seeing that, they were, they were ready to crown Jesus king. And, and, and then we know from the rest of the, and, and the next few verses is when uh, the disciples depart out into the sea and the storm comes and Jesus comes walking on to the sea and, and he tells them to, that it is I and be not afraid. And then we see these, this same multitude, if you will, in verses 22 through 24. And they, the Bible says, and I'm not going to read it, but the Bible says that when they, that next day, uh, when, when they woke up and they saw that, that uh, Jesus, that the disciples had gotten into the ship and that Jesus stayed behind. They knew that he stayed behind. And when they saw that he wasn't there, uh, they began to look for him. And they actually got into a ship, the Bible says, and they sailed to Capernaum. And the Bible says that they sailed in verse number 24, seeking for Jesus. So this group was very, I mean, if, if you were just watching this, this multitude here get into a ship and seeking after Jesus, you would think, man, what passion they have. Man, what zeal they have for God. I mean, they're, they're getting into a ship and sailing across the sea just to go find Jesus. That's what they were doing. And, and, and very zealous. From the outside, you, that's what you would say. You would say, man, and they were. The Bible says they were seeking for him. They were, they were, they, 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 they were going after him from the outside. It would, it would seem as though it was very true, and, 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 but... The moment that Jesus started to speak truth to them is where they had a problem. I mean, they were very zealous. They, they, were, they, were, they got in the ship and they crossed the whole sea. But when Jesus started speaking truth to them, they didn't like it very much. They had a problem. In verses 26 and 27, Jesus started speaking to them about and revealing to them about why they were actually following him. In verse number 27, Six, it says, And Jesus said unto them, 
answered and said unto the, or first in verse 25, let's read that. When they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus, he didn't even answer that question. He just said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Jesus knew their heart. He knew why they were really following him. And he knows our hearts. And he knows why we really follow him. And they followed him. The Bible, Jesus said, because you... Because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. They sought him only for their selfish, fleshly, to satisfy their carnal desires. That's what he said. That's what he told them. I mean, anybody else standing around would have said, Man, look at them. They are some Jesus followers, son. They are in a ship going after him. And when they get to Jesus, he says, You're not seeking me for the right reason. You're seeking me because I filled your belly satisfied your flesh, satisfied your carnal appetites. And that's nothing new to Scripture. Paul said in Romans chapter number 16 and verse 17 through 18, Paul is warning the church to mark people, to mark men that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. And he tells them to avoid them. And this is how he describes those men. He says, For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. They don't really serve the Lord. They're they're, they're trying to... It's really their flesh is what they're serving. In Philippians chapter 3, this one... This is some strong language here, but this is the Apostle Paul. I mean, this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now he's describing people who, are, who he claims are enemies of the cross of Christ. And he describes them as, in Philippians 3.19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. They're enemies of the cross because they really don't serve Jesus. They're just, trying to, they're, they're just out there trying to satisfy their flesh. You say, well, how can you do that? Well, a lot of people will do it with pride. I'm just trying to satisfy this desire of pride. So really, I'm not. I'm gonna act like I'm serving Jesus, but what I really want is for people to look at me. That's just one instance. But these people were only after Jesus, really, for what Jesus could do for them. They didn't. They weren't really worried about knowing who He was. They weren't worried about that. They were like, "Oh, He filled. He did. The, he filled our bellies, and we want to." They were just all about satisfying their flesh. And then he tells them that they, and they really didn't have any desire for spiritual things. They didn't have any desire to know him. It was just to fill their own lust for their temporary satisfaction. Look at verse number 27. He says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him hath God the Father sealed. They were, they, were only, they were only searching after Him for some temporary satisfaction. For something temporary. I'm just going to feel this desire that I have. I'm just going to serve Jesus while it feels good. But when it doesn't feel good, I'm out. I'm only going to, I'm only going to serve Him while it's feeling good, while, while it feels good, while everything's good. Something that's temporary. I'm not really serving Him for, 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 for eternal life, in this thing for the long haul. And he told the truth about that. They didn't really like it much. But then He told them the truth about how they sought for Him. In verses 28 and 29, this multitude says, then they said to him, what, watch what they said. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him. See, they were, they were thinking that they could do these things under their... They, could, they, it, it was, it, they had trusted in the ability of their flesh. Under the power of their... They were seeking after Him for the pleasures of their flesh and they were doing it under the power of their flesh. What can I do? And Jesus said, this is the work of God. Believe on me. Trust me. They said, what shall we do? And Jesus said to them that they were to believe upon Him who had sent. And in verse number 63, He tells them that your flesh profiteth nothing. 
trying to serve God and trying to seek after Him under the power of their own flesh, He says, it profiteth you nothing. And Jesus begins to speak truth to them in the rest of the verses after that about being the bread of life, that He was the true bread that came from heaven, that, that how He was going to give his, his, his flesh for the life of the world, and that He was the only one that could give life. And they didn't, they didn't understand it. They didn't like it. And just a, a side note, and, ver, and, I, and I believe that uh, the religious crowd here, because now Jesus is in the synagogue teaching this, and, and I believe the religious crowd also didn't help the matters any. Uh, in verse number 41, it, the Bible said when he's teaching these things, he says, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. In verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves. The Jews were very religious, right? They were a very religious group. And the religious people were striving against him and murmuring against him. And in verse 60, the Bible says, Many therefore, after Jesus had said all these things, spoke the truth about how he was the bread of life, and that he came to give life, he came to give his flesh for the world. Verse number 6, he said, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When they heard the truth about him, they said, This is hard saying. It was offensive to them. It was absurd, the things he was saying, when Jesus was speaking the truth. They didn't like it. They, it, it, didn't, it didn't line up with what their flesh was after. It didn't line up for how they, how they thought they could get this, uh, get what Jesus was offering them. And they didn't like that fact because it didn't satisfy their flesh. It was difficult. It made them uncomfortable. And of course it would. The Bible says that our, that our flesh, our, the, our, car, our carnal mind is at enmity with God. Our flesh is against the things of God. And when, they, when they were seeking after Jesus at, because of the, uh, trying to satisfy their pleasures of their flesh and, and under the power of their flesh, and when Jesus spoke truth to them, they didn't understand it was very hard. Who can hear it? And that was the moment that they, uh, 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 concerning these group that had left away, the crowd that departed. And then we see that in verse 66 it says, From that time... Many of his disciples went back. See, when the truth became offensive and they didn't agree with their flesh, they went back. When it became a hard thing to follow God, you know, they were seeking after Him, hoping for one thing. When God revealed to them, you're going about it all wrong and that's not the way it's going to happen. It became a hard thing to follow the Lord then. And they went back. Immediately my mind went to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And every time they came to a hard point, every time they needed something, immediately they began to question God and tempt God and say, it would be better for us if we would have just stayed in Egypt. Let's turn around and go back to Egypt. They went back. And then the magnitude of it, they, they didn't walk. They said, watch what the Bible says. And they walked no more with him. The prodigal story doesn't happen all the time. We want to think it does. And I believe one of the lies the enemy tells our young people is just, you remember the prodigal, just go out there and, and you can do it and you can come back. But you can but these disciples, they went back and they didn't walk with him no more. Doesn't always work out that way. Doesn't always. There's stories and after stories, which you could probably tell. I'm sure, Brother Jeremy, you probably got plenty of them with dealing with young people over the years that you've seen. They've walked away and they probably fit this. They walked away and they walked with them no more. And it's the truth. And this is what happens. This crowd that departed left because their flesh, it became hard to follow God when, 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 when the truth of Jesus Christ began to go against what was pleasing to their flesh and, and how they thought they could get it under the power of their flesh. 
And then I want you to notice the call. That was the crowd that departed, but then I want you to notice the call for examination in verse 67. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? So this whole crowd, the majority of the people there walked away from the Lord, and the Lord looks at the twelve, and He asks them a question. Will you also go away? He looked at the faithful, the one who hadn't left, and he looked at them. I believe testing them. I believe testing their faith. I believe putting their faith on trial. Will you also walk away? And there will be times in our life, I know we're here on a Wednesday night, you could probably be considered the faithful. And there's going to be times when our faith is tested. When it becomes hard to follow the Lord. Will you also go away? Will you also walk away? It was a time to examine their self. Tonight's a time to examine ourselves. Will we also walk away? Will you give in to the doubts of others? If others doubt Him, if others say that's not, I'm not following Him no more, will you also walk away? Is the truth offensive to you? Is there something in your life that maybe is not sitting well with your flesh? Maybe something that has been preached. Maybe something that's going on in your life and it's become hard to follow the Lord. Are you going to leave also? Look at yourself. Examine yourself. Why are you following the Lord? Are you following Him to somehow satisfy some fleshly desire? Some, are you following Him just for temporary satisfaction? I'm only coming, I'm only going to try to serve Him while it feels good, while everything's good, but, but, but when it gets hard, I'm out. Are you trusting in the ability of your flesh like that crowd that left? How about this, are you going to follow the crowd? The, the majority, you, gotta, you understand, the majority of the people left. Probably some of the, and, and quote unquote, the smartest people of their day, those Jews, those religious, they were probably scribes and Pharisees there saying, listen, they did it before in the Gospels. They, they, and I can't remember where it is exactly, but the Pharisees had said uh, something to the effect, and I'll have to find it later, but the Pharisees said something to the effect of, of Basically, of, of you know, we study the law, we know these things, and so if we're not saying it's true, then you shouldn't believe it. I'll have to find it exactly because I don't want you to just think I'm making it up, but I, I, I'll find it and give it to you later because I don't want you to think I'm just making something up. And you have to think of all that, and all of them walked away. Well, you go away. And this, this question, as I said, rings today. When the testing of our faith comes, when people leave, doubt creeps in, when, when, when others walk away, when it gets hard to follow them, will, will you also walk away? If the best Christian you know quits, will you? Listen to me, young people. If your parents quit, will you? If your family says, I've had enough of this, I'm leaving, are you going to follow your parents? Hey, parents, if your kids quit, are you going to say, well, I just need to go be with them? God forbid, but what if, what if the pastor quits? What if your spiritual hero falls and quits and walks away? Will you also walk away? That's the question, will you, will you also go away? It's a time of testing, a time of examining. And before we are too quick to answer, let's look at Peter's response. Because this is the confession that anchored him. We saw the crowd that departed the call for examination, but this is the, this is the confession that anchored the faithful. Look what Peter said. Then Simon Peter answered him, and Lord, to whom... Shall we go? What anchored Peter was a to whom. We'll say more about that later. But it wasn't a what. It wasn't a where. He said to whom shall we go? The superiority of Christ 
was the first thing that anchored him. He confessed that Christ was far better than those, than those fishing nets, that Christ was far better than that old life he could go back to, that Christ was far better than that, than, than, than that religion he could go back to. He was far better than the Pharisees. He was far better than the scribes. There was nothing that compared to him is what Peter said. Lord, to whom shall we go? Where else are we going to go? To whom? And Christ, listen to me, Christ, Jesus Christ is far better than anything that this world can offer. He is more precious than silver or gold. His wisdom is greater than any of the greatest minds in the world. He is more powerful than any government. He is more powerful than any army. And His grace is greater than any of your sin. His blood cleanses every, every stain of sin. And His righteousness is what satisfied God's wrath on the cross. And His, His love is the greatest love that this world has ever known because He came and He died for His enemies. And He's far better. He's far better than anything that this world ever has. Anything that you could ever go back to. It's Him. It's Him. To whom shall we go? The Bible says in Philippians 2.9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Him, given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and in things in the earth and things under the earth. I like Colossians 1.16-19. It says, For by Him... Were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, and all things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, in all things, He might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. When the question came to Peter and those other disciples and said, Will you go away also? Peter just couldn't imagine that anything, anything out there, anything that could attract his flesh, anything that this world could offer could be better than Jesus Christ Himself. And it was that Christ was far better. It was nothing that could compare to Him. Because there ain't nothing like Him. I want you to notice that it was their view of the Savior that anchored them. It's how big He was. That nothing could possibly be better than Him. And See, this is what's wrong with the modern Christianity. It's more man-centered. It's all about man. It's all about me. It's all about... It's all about how you feel and, and what you feel is truth and what you feel is right. There is nothing, it's, there is no view of God. There is no high view of God. Let me tell you, that is not, the Bible takes a high view of Christ. That the, the Bible is Christ centered, it is not man centered. It's all about Him. And Paul had this same view in Philippians 3 8. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Everything that this world could offer to Him, every, 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 I mean, he was one of the, he, he, he studied under one of the smartest men in his day, uh, Gamaliel, I think is how you pronounce his name. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a, I mean, he was the Hebrew of the, he said he had so much zeal that he persecuted the church. And he said, I counted all that, but nothing. Anything that I could attain in this world was nothing. So that I may win him. That's how big Christ was to him. That's how big of a view he had. He counted everything but dung, but nothing that I may win him. The superiority, the supremacy of Christ, that, that's going to anchor you when, you when your faith is tested. 
When a temptation arises to walk away, when it gets hard to walk to, and, and the temptation is there and others may leave, you know what's going to anchor you? That there's nothing better than Him. Amen. Ain't nothing else better than Him. Right. He said, to whom shall we go? And then we see the sor- He is the source of eternal life. Look what He says next. He says in verse 68, to whom shall we go? He says, thou hast the words of eternal life. Again, Peter is, it's, it, he, Peter's not relying on himself. He's not relying on any power. But he looks at Christ and he says, You have, you have, thou hast the words of eternal life. And listen, it is true that eternal life is just that. It's everlasting life where you will never die. And it's, it's, we think of heaven. We think of the fact that we're not going to face hell that our, our body may die, but we'll forever be with the Lord. Be absent from the body is be present with the Lord. It is We have eternal life. And while that is true, it's, it's not just not dying. Eternal life. Because according to Jesus himself, in John chapter number 17, in the high priestly prayer to the Father, Jesus says in John 17, 3, And this is life eternal that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom Thou had sent. You know what eternal life is? What life eternal is? It's knowing God. It's knowing Him. It's sinful men, as wicked and as rotten and as dirty as me and you, who was alienated, who was separated, who was without God, who all we deserved was to be thrown in hell. It's us wicked men and God so holy and sin cannot enter into His presence. It's men like us knowing the true God and fellowshipping with the true God and knowing who He is. That's what life is. That is eternal life is you, me, as sinful creatures that we get to actually know and fellowship with our Heavenly Father. It's knowing God. It's knowing Him. And He is the only way to eternal life, to knowing God. Jesus says that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. They are one. Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. And eternal life is to know the only true God. If you remember that crowd that walked with Him no more, that went back, they was not concerned with knowing Him. Remember, they was just worried about what they could get from Him. They weren't concerned about, i got to know Him. Like Paul said, that I may know Him. They weren't concerned about knowing Him more. It was just, what can they get from Him? And look where the words or look where eternal life comes from. It does something from Christ. It says, Thou hast the words. His words is the source of eternal life, of knowing God, knowing Him in a intimate, in a, in a fellowship, knowing Him in communion, knowing who God is. And we know that Jesus is the incarnate Word. The Bible says in John 1 verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus Christ Himself is eternal life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But also the Word, we, we get eternal life from, the, from His inspired Word, from His words. Verse 63 says that it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. His words. It is through His word that that we even can come to have the saving knowledge of Christ. It is through His word. That that is how the Bible says that uh, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. When, when When a preacher or somebody preaches the gospel, that is what God uses, His preach word. He uses His word to and the Holy Spirit to convict the hearts of man. And convict the sinner and let them know of their sinful condition. Then he draws them to himself and it's through faith in what Christ said and who he is and what he done that we may know him. That is, that is life eternal. I wish, I wish what I'm feeling in here I could be able to express it with my words. 
Because when I think of how wicked I am, but the fact that every day I get to sit and I get to pray to the heavenly, to, the, to the, my heavenly Father, to the God of heaven, and I get to open His Word and I get to hear Him speak to me through His Word and I get to know Him, that is life eternal. That is, no, that is knowing God and that we can do that. Oh, that's amazing. It's amazing that we can actually know God. It's a saving knowledge of God. We, we know Him. It's eternal life. Every, everything, that, everything that is essential that we need in our Christian life, He has. Everything that we need, He has it. It is His words. It is His word. And, and through knowing Him more, the Bible says that he, he, we are to be changed into His image and that comes by knowing Him more through His words. As we begin to know more about Christ, we, we are, the Holy Spirit cleanses us and conforms us to His image. Listen, as we begin to know more about Him, and we begin to know Him more, that strengthens you and I. It strengthens us as we begin to know more about Him. It strengthens us. It sustains us in this life. It is in Christ alone and His words. That, that's what Paul said. He says, you have the words of eternal life. You have what we need. It's you alone. You have it. It was for eternal life. It was to know Him. It's Christ alone and His words as the anchor because it is the source of eternal life. It is the well that we run to when we're dry. It's our strength in the midst of troubles. It cleanses us when we're Walking with Him. His word is alive and powerful. And I express this to the teenagers a lot. This is, uh, I, 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 try, I, I talk to them a lot about reading the Bible, reading the Bible, and it's not, listen to me, and it's not so you can just be filled with a bunch of knowledge so you can always be right about everything. No, the, we, we, we read the Bible because the Bible is supernatural. And it is profitable for your life. It's not just to fill your head with knowledge so you can go around and beat everybody over the head with it and tell them how right you are. It's because it is supernatural and it was profitable and we need it. We need it to know more about Him. It, it, it is His Word. It is this Word that anchors us. And not only that, but what else anchored Him was the, sure, the sureness that He is who He claims to be. See, it wasn't just... It wasn't just the superiority of Christ. Who, you know, he, who else could we go to? There ain't nothing better than you. It's the source of eternal life. Lord, you have what we need to, to know you more. You have it, and, and we need that. But then he says in verse number 69, And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God, First, he says, we believe. And they first believed when he was walking and he called them all by name. And he called them and he said, follow me. And they left their nets and they left their jobs and they left their family. And they believed in who he said he was. And they followed him. They dropped everything and, and, they, and they left their old life. They, 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 they repented, if you will. They left that old life behind and they began to follow Him, trusting in who He said He was. And listen, if you're saved in here tonight, it happened to you very similar. When you got saved, you believed because He called unto you. And He called unto you and, and, and you repented and you turned from your old life and you repented towards God and you, and you believed and trusted in what Christ said and you trusted that He is who He says He is. But then he says, we believe and are sure. He says, are sure. Sure means the certainly to know. It means that I have come to full assurance that you are who you say you are. I believed you and I followed you on this journey. And they believed him and they followed him on this journey of following him. 
And then throughout their time with him, they got to see blind men's eyes become, uh, they could see. And then they got to see the lame walk. They got to see him walk out in the storm and say, peace be still, be not afraid. And he did all these things. And Christ did all these things so that they can, uh, they can become sure that he is who he says he is. He did all this to prove himself to them that he was who he said he was. And it assured them that many times in our life, the Lord puts you and I in situations. He puts you and I in trials. He puts you and I in hard things. And we walk through storms and we walk through valleys. And he doesn't do it to hurt us. And it may bring pain. And it may bring heartache. But he's doing it so he can prove to you that he is who he says he is. He's doing it to prove to you that he is that Christ. The son of the living God. See, sometimes he just takes his children through things to let his children know, I'm still him. I'm still the God that you believed in, that you trusted in, you trusted your life with. Earlier in the, in the year, I'm telling you earlier, this about really the past two years, we've been well, three years maybe, we, we went, God has just took us through Difficult things, whether it be church hurt, whether it be whatever, being in the hospital and, and things happening with Rhett and things happening with Peyton. But throughout all that, and I ain't going to sit up here like we're some super spiritual and we just had, you know, we never worried and we never did any of that. But through all that, Brother Benny, I got to see God. Just prove to me <laughs> that he is who he says he is. He just proved time and time again I am faithful like I told you I'd be. He proved to me that he is sovereign. Don't let that word scare you. He is. And he proved to me that he is as he maneuvered things in that hospital and set things in motion. And I just got to sit there like I was sitting there watching a big screen TV. Of all this unfolding, the whole time it just concreted in my heart more and more. It just shored it up in my heart and in my mind that he is who he says he is. And I don't know, and listen, he don't do it so that we may boast. And he don't do it that we may, that we may say, look how much faith we had. But it's so when we come out of those things, we may say, look who he is. And so that it may anchor us. And I don't know, you may be here tonight and you may be facing the, one of those things. And God may be gotten you in a hard situation. But listen to me. As a child, he will prove himself. It may not be that you get out of whatever you're in. It may just be looking back, you may say, Boy, how in the world did I make it through that? How in the world did I do that? And the only thing you can be able to say is I'm sure that thou art that Christ. That you are who you say you are. And in times of those things of trials and temptation, when it gets hard, he's taken us through that. So when it... In times when maybe it is difficult. In times when our faith is tested and maybe others are walking away. To you, when the question comes in your mind, will you also go away? You may not only be able to say, well, there ain't nothing better than him. You may be only be able to say, uh, you have the source, you have the words of eternal life. I want to know you more. But also, so that you may say, we believe and we are sure. That you can look back and you can see time after time where he has proved himself to you that he is who he says he is. And that ought to anchor you. 
that ought to anchor you, where you will not give up, where you will not quit, where you will not walk away. Dylan, if you want to come, I'm done. This is the application, if you will. It's clear that Peter's answer, the answer to the question of will you go away, Peter did not, it was not found in a what. It was not found, his, his, what anchored him was not in what and it was not in where, but clearly he said to whom. And everything was directed towards him. Who shall we go? You have the words. We believe who you are. We are sure who you are. The anchor of the faithful, it is Christ. That's what the message is. What anchors the faithful Christians, it is Jesus Christ. It's Christ and it's Him alone that anchors the faithful. You look at any season, any, any, any maybe older a person who's been serving the Lord a long time, and they've been through difficult things, and I can promise you, if you would go ask them, they'd probably say it's Him. How have you made it through this? And how have you made it through that? How have you made it through times when people walked away and when it got hard and they'd only be able to say, I believe if they were true, faithful Christians, they could only be able to say, it's only because of Him. It's only because of Christ. And He's the anchor. He is what anchored me. He is what anchored me. So you want to be different. You want to be set apart. It was, G- it was Christ that set the 12 apart, and I'll get to you know who later in a minute. But it was Christ and Him alone that was the difference between the ones that stayed and the ones that left. Those many that left, they, it, wasn't, it wasn't about Jesus. They didn't want just Him. They didn't want to serve Him for who He was and know Him. It was, it was their flesh. And, and it was all that. But the ones that stayed, it was because Christ. It was all Him. It was all Him. It was all Him. See, the anchor of the faithful is not in our own power. It's not in religion. It's not in any new trend. It's not in any new way or idea. It wasn't even in any tradition. Peter didn't say that. But what did he say? He said, to whom? He said, who? It was Christ that anchored him. So cling to Jesus. Rest in Him. Walk with Him. Fellowship with Him. Because it is Him alone that has the power to keep you. It's only Him. You can't keep yourself. You can't. It's Jesus. And he made it very plain. The words of Jesus, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I am him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That's what he said. For without me, you can do nothing. That means, in the Greek, nothing means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing. Just name it. Well, I can not, not without Jesus you can't. You say, well, you're just being, I'm just being what the Bible says. Actually, what Jesus, the words of Jesus said. I mean, it's all his word, but you know what I mean. These are the red letters, you know. He said, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. So what is it in your life? Maybe that you're trying to do. But it ain't Him. Maybe you're in this life and you're trying. Maybe you're facing some temptation, some trial. Maybe you are doubting. Maybe you're in this place where your faith is being tested. And it's like the Lord saying, are you going to go away also? What will your answer be? I thought about that many times, Brother Benny, as I read this and studying this. Because listen to me, if it was anything, well, bless God, i tell you why I won't, because I, you're already wrong. Because Peter didn't say I. He said, to whom shall we go? 
Thou hast the words. We believe and are sure that you are that Christ. And nothing about him. I tell you why I won't. I tell you why I won't leave because I have done this, because I do this, because I uh, read this, or because I go here, or because I don't go there. That's not what he said. He said, To whom shall we go? To whom? So what are you trusting in? Yourself? Trusting in yourself to keep you? You trusted in religion? You trust them because you go to them a Baptist church? Well, I'm a Baptist. And there's nothing, please understand, I'm not, I'm not being, you know, you know what I'm being, you know what I'm saying. I hope you understand who I am. That's, I'm not downgrading any of that. You understand. I'm just simply giving to you the text of what the Bible says. As he said, to whom shall we go? And it wasn't any of that. I'm not saying those things don't matter. I'm saying, what did Peter say? What did the Bible say? What did Paul say over and over? It was about him. It was about him that I may know him. You trusted in others to keep you? Young people, you trusted in your, well, you know, as long as mom and dad is here, as long as mom and dad's doing it, what is anchoring you? I thought many times of what would I say? What have I, what, what would have I have said to Jesus? I wonder how I would have started that off. If I'd have said, Lord, there ain't nothing like you. Because there may have been some days where I get full of myself and I say, I tell you why I won't leave. I tell you why I won't walk away. Because I. Maybe some of you are not in a trying time where your faith is being tested, but maybe, maybe you just need to come and ask Him to give you strength for when it comes. And Lord, Lord, anchor me. Lord, keep me. Anchor me, please. Maybe you're here and you're like the crowd that's left. You're the crowd that's departed. And you've walked away. Maybe you... Maybe, maybe, maybe you seem to have a zeal for Christ, but your fleshly, your motive is fleshly. You're trying to make it on your own strength. Or maybe you never believed on Jesus. Jesus told these people that. He said, there's some of you that don't even believe. He said some. Maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Maybe you don't have eternal life. But maybe, maybe you are. I'll say this. Maybe, maybe you... Maybe you have been away. Maybe you have walked away. I'm here to tell you that you can, you can come back. If you're one of His, you can come back. If you're not one of His, you can get saved. You can get saved. But I want to say this. You know Judas was a part of the twelve. Jesus said that he had the devil. Listen to me. Judas was a part of the crowd, of the faithful crowd. He looked like him, talked like him, but he was a devil, the Bible says. And I wonder if you would, I wonder if, if I wonder maybe you're just going along with the faithful. Yeah, you tell them, Peter. I agree with Peter. Tell them. But he knew. Christ knew. And you, there might be someone here tonight, and you're just here with the crowd, with the faithful crowd, but you ain't never, you don't know Jesus. You don't know eternal life. You need to repent, and you need to trust in Christ alone for salvation. The anchor of the faithful, I believe from the scripture. From looking at this, what anchored Peter was Jesus Christ and Him alone. And I want to ask you tonight, who is your anchor? What is it that's keeping you? What is it that has anchored you? Is it Him? Or are you trusted in something else? Have you ever been saved? Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know Him as your Savior? He died for you. He loves you and He died for you. Trust in Him.
Trust in Him. He's the only one that can anchor you. He's the only one that can keep you. As we stand. Give you an opportunity to come if you want. Pray. All right, if you're watching this video, you've just watched one of our services here at Grace Baptist Church, and our number one desire is to see sinners come to know the Lord as their Savior. And uh, I'll read something from the Bible here in 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 13. The Bible says that these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is what I like, the most important part that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And that's our number one goal at Grace Baptist Church is for people to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they have eternal life through Jesus Christ. The book of Ephesians, chapter number 2, verse number 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, that's an, that's a, to me, those two verses are two of my most favorite verses in the Bible because it, it, it's, it's a simple plan. For by grace are you saved through faith, that we put our faith and our trust in that gift, and that's the gift of Jesus Christ from God to this world. Uh, you know, the only way that we could go to heaven um, is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He's, it's the only way uh, to have uh, access to heaven is through accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Uh, you know, a lot of people are mistaken today, and they think that, uh, you know, being a good person, attending church, or maybe even tithing or giving money to the church uh, uh, gains them access to heaven. But in reality... Uh, the only way that we can have access to heaven is through Jesus Christ, the door. And he is the only way. He said, I am the way. And uh, and I want to invite you today that if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would ask that you would take this time to bow your head and, 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 and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart and pray a simple prayer. I'm not I'm not going to give you the exact words to pray. It's it's a prayer between you and the Lord, but I would say that you would just model the prayer after this. Lord, I'm a sinner and I realize that without you I have no access into heaven. Without you I have no way uh to forgive my sins. And Lord, I invite you to come into my heart, forgive me of my sins and become my savior. If you would pray something similar to that, and mean it from the bottom of your heart, and have full faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he'll do that. He said that he would. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you do that today, we would love to hear from you. If you would, just send a message to our church Facebook page, call us or send us an email, and we'd love to have the feedback and know that someone accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. If we can do anything for you here at Grace Baptist Church as far as prayer or whatever, just give us a call. Reach out to us. Let us know. If you have any questions about salvation, you can always call our office or reach out to us online, and we'll be glad to help you with that. Thank you. God bless.